Hi, Hi, Mom. What's up? I've got the new show. It's about weed. Oh, my God. Don't smoke it on camera, please. Please, please, Nana. I'm going to give you a bad example the tutor. Okay, okay, Mom. Are you getting high? What? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, this is in your eyes. Turn over the room and okay, put it in the chair. Okay, good idea, Mom. on the table. I don't want my kids to see me drinking alcohol. I smoke pot. <laughs> I'm in Portland, Oregon, where medical marijuana is legal. I've come to a barbecue for kids with cancer who use weed as a medicine. This used to be our garage. This is uplifting and euphoric. It's now widely accepted that medical marijuana works as a remedy for the side effects of cancer treatments. Medical massable. That's for the cancer kids. But these people actually believe that weed can cure cancer. I have a couple level twos that are like black cherry, blue raspberry. Yeah. The kids medicate with hyperpotent marijuana gummy candies. Mmm, yummy. They're like, you give what to your kid? You give this to your kid? And the parents smoke highly concentrated marijuana, known as dabbing, to cope with their own ailments. When we tell them we do it, we just don't do it in front of them. They don't need to know how to go smoke out of the box. No, we call it medicating. Yeah. This is phenomenal medication. Is this really okay? A family where the parents and the kids are super stoned? Federal criminalization of marijuana, dating back to 1951, cast marijuana as a social ill. So the medical benefits went largely unstudied. So in this vacuum of menses, are we seeing parents doing everything they can to save their dying children? Or a perversion of our too loose medical marijuana laws? I wanted to find out. My investigation began three weeks earlier. I traveled to the town of Scapoose, just outside of Portland, Oregon, to meet seven-year-old Loran, who has a deadly form of leukemia given just two years to live by some doctors, her mother turned to weed as a last ditch attempt to save her daughter's life. So what's at the top of this hill? Probably, you don't all know. No. The dog is the one that's up here. He's dead, okay? Okay. I still love him, even if he's up my little bones. Uh -huh. Where we live, lots of bad cats. There are a lot of bad cats around here? Yes. Be careful. I know my way around here. Here it is. The pile of rocks where my dog was at. How old was your dog? Uh, he was a kid dog. A little puppy? Yeah. He got the mice for us. He, well, it's kind of gross for a dog. Usually the cats do it, but he ate the mice. <laughs> oh, really? Yes. He ate mice? Yes. Were you always able to take walks like this and play with dirt and have a good time? Uh, not always. I was up in the hospital. Hospital said, no digging in the dirt. Or tell me about how you first knew that she was sick. We were getting ready to go to a friend's wedding. And my dad picked her up and was like, um, her armpit lymph nodes are huge. You should probably go get her looked at. When we finally went in there, we got seen by a doctor and he's like, your test results have come back uh, like preliminary for leukemia. I've called a children's hospital in the area and they're expecting you in the emergency room. So just go there. <laughs> and so we started chemo like that night. That night, that yeah, very that evening. evening. Loran was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia, a rare form of cancer with a high mortality rate. Her first round of chemo would last six months. She would follow this a year later with a bone marrow transplant and a further round of chemo a year after that, as well as radiation therapy. So what's this place all about? It's special to me. It's a great hideout place. These pine needles smell really nice. Right? Yeah. That's cool. Take a wolf and it's still good. <laughs> Once when I was in the hospital, I was so mad at the coyotes and bobcats. Why? The coyotes pooped in here. 
and the bobcats left big hair balls. Do you remember when you didn't have any hair? Yes. What was that like? It felt embarrassing. Imagine going back there, being tortured there. The cancer kept coming back yeah. after yes. conventional therapy. Like our prognosis was 75 to 80%. When it came back a second time, our prognosis was 50%. And then since it came back a third time with her this last time, it dropped it down to 30. A 30% chance of survival. Yeah. That's September. So. That's, what, six months from now? Yeah. I mean, that's horrifying. Yeah. I don't want to think about that. <laughs> so. A couple of my friends died. And they were also sick? Yeah. Their hearts stopped working. We had the option at that point to take her home and make her comfortable and not pursue treatment. And I was like, well, that's not, that's not okay with me. Feeling like Western medicine had failed her child, Kalina decided on a radical new treatment for her daughter. When someone said to you, like, cannabis can be a treatment for cancer, what did you think? First I thought they were nuts. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm not a recreational user at all. I never thought that it would be something that I would be pursuing for my child. Those who believe weed is a cure theorize that highly concentrated doses of cannabis oil will actually shrink tumors. Cancer is a disease where some of the body's cells divide rapidly without stopping, disabling the body's natural cycle of cell death and rebirth. Chemotherapy works by attacking those fast-dividing cancer cells, but it also attacks other healthy fast-dividing cells, like those in your digestive tract or hair follicles. They feel cannabis, on the other hand, helps the body resume its natural cycle of cell death, killing cancer cells without harming any other healthy cells. To be effective, the cannabis has to be so concentrated that one capsule contains the equivalent of roughly 10 bong rips of high-grade medical marijuana. You can see it hit her face, like, right away. The feeling is just so weird, like, How's the feeling get to you? Wait. You can definitely tell. You can tell? <laughs> oh, yeah. But is that, does that feel strange to see, like, your kid, you know, getting high? Not necessarily, just because I know, I know it's helping. Loran did eventually undergo one final round of chemo and another bone marrow transplant at the end of 2013. Kalina credits the cannabis for Loran's speedy recovery and the quick return of her white blood cells killed by the chemo. After our second transplant, we didn't need blood transfusions after day plus 18. I see what it's doing for her. I think it's helping aid her recovery like nobody's business. I will sing its praises until the cows come home. Loran has been in remission ever since. We aren't out of the woods yet, so to speak, as far as getting to the word cure, but we're getting there. Cancer is going to become the leading cause of death for Americans as early as 2030. And so far, all the cutting-edge therapies are complicated, expensive, and invasive. What if weed has been the hiding-in-plain-sight answer all along? I wanted to know what the mainstream medical community thought about cannabis as a cancer treatment. So I traveled to San Francisco for answers. I'm here to talk to Dr. Donald Abrams. He's a cancer specialist at the University of California, San Francisco, and he's the chief of oncology at San Francisco General Hospital. When this hospital became ground zero for the AIDS epidemic in the 80s, Dr. Abrams began pioneering marijuana as an HIV therapy and has since become a leading proponent for its use by cancer patients. I've come to learn about marijuana's current role in cancer therapy and what his thoughts are on its potential as a cancer cure. I wish I had my voice. I have a little laryngitis at the moment. Okay. Apparently I named the, the AIDS virus, too. You named the AIDS yeah, virus? Yes, HIV. Yeah, I wrote the letter to Harold Varmus uh -huh. suggesting that HIV be the name of the AIDS virus. Yeah, so at the beginning of the AIDS crisis, this is, was the epicenter of the AIDS uh, clinical care. I think the AIDS work on the frontiers allowed me to be comfortable being pretty much out there by myself. Sure. And then in 1992, I was challenged to study cannabis in patients with AIDS wasting syndrome. Because you're sort of on the frontier in a sense. Trying to study cannabis when yep. nobody else did. Cool. 
This is your office. All right. So what use does marijuana play in uh, cancer treatment? As an oncologist for 32 years, I recommend cannabis to patients on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Patients being treated for cancer suffer from nausea, loss of appetite, pain, depression, and insomnia. Instead of writing prescriptions for five different medicines, I could recommend the patients try one medicine, and that's cannabis. THC is the most potent psychoactive compound in the plant. I think that was identified in the 60s. Mm -hmm. The THC binds to something in the human brain, and that was subsequently identified as the cannabinoid one receptor. In fact, it's the first or second most densely populated receptor in the human brain. And we have these receptors in our brain, and so does every animal species, down to sponges. Mm -hmm. Why should a monkey and a dog have a CB1 receptor? They don't smoke cannabis. Sure. So then we learned that just like we make our own opiates, the endorphins, we make endocannabinoids. What does it mean that there is an endocannabinoid system? I think most of the evidence suggests that the whole system is to help us to forget and that specifically to help us forget pain. Huh. Animals that are praying for their food often get into situations that are painful. Mm -hmm. We have to get over that pain. But what if blasting the endocannabinoid system with THC can do more than just help us forget pain? What if it could also help control the natural cycle of cell death, known as apoptosis, thereby killing the cancer? Sounds far-fetched. But in 2001, a hemp farmer from Nova Scotia named Rick Simpson treated his own cancer with highly concentrated THC oil to great effect. His stories spawned an industry of Rick Simpson oil makers, providing medicine to an ever-growing group of cancer patients estimated to be in the thousands. The theory is supported in the pages of many peer-reviewed medical journals that have published dozens of small-scale studies that demonstrate the effective anti-tumor role cannabinoids can play in the treatment of a variety of cancers. What is your <clears throat> medical opinion about cannabis as a cancer treatment? I do see many patients in my practice who use cannabis oil in conjunction with their standard conventional cancer treatment. Mm -hmm. Some of them seem to do better than I would expect them to do. There is good evidence in the test tube and in animal models that cannabis may have anti-cancer activity, may block cell division, may block new blood vessel formation, and may block the ability of cells to become invasive and metastasize. In the test tube, that doesn't necessarily translate to what it does in people. And how would we find that out? We have to do carefully controlled clinical trials to see what the benefits are and what the risks are. And we don't have that with cannabis oil at this point. So we met Dr. Abrams in San Francisco, and he was clear that we need double-blind clinical trials before we can say with any certainty that weed can kill cancer cells. What I'm realizing is that this is a critical moment in time. The lack of studies actually empowers people because they believe that they're living proof that it works. Are they deluded or are they truly pioneers? Cancer. Yes, not any growers are willing to uh, have children. Why do you think people aren't willing to do it? Fear of repercussion from the government. I can't say that we've never had any sleepless nights looking over our sh shoulder or wondering. It's uh, one thing to distribute a, a controlled substance and another thing to distribute it to a matter. Even though weed is legal in the state of Oregon, it's still a controlled substance, meaning it's illegal on a federal level. So the feds could still bust Frankie, and that's a pretty massive risk considering children are involved. He didn't seem like a snake oil salesman at all, quite the contrary. But what I really wanted to do was try his oil. We just did a harvest, right? Yes. Took down some buds and some leaves from plants. So can you take me through how you know you make oil out of it? There are a number of solvents that will work, but what we like to use and what we suggest 
It's just regular grain alcohol. It removes the cannabinoids from the uh, plant matter. Mm -hmm. Okay, just strips them down into a liquid. Then we'll strain the liquid back off and just remove the liquid, evaporate the alcohol, and what we're left with are the cannabinoids or the cannabis oil. So we're gonna just soak this for about three to five minutes. We shake it up a little bit, just agitate it. Hello? <laughs> Give it a shake. Give it a shake, that's it. <laughs> It, it's almost painful to see like that much bud like mm -hmm. submerged in a liquid. It took, it took a while to get used to that. It <laughs> right. really did. It's like, what are you doing? You're ruining it. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what it felt like at first. <laughs> yeah, and you can see it, it isn't really that deep of a color. It's just sort of. Yeah, typically you should get about three to five grams of oil per ounce uh -huh. of bud. All right, here it comes. There's a lot of weed in that very small amount of liquid. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. So let's take this inside, put it on our coffee warmer. Mm -hmm. This is about 110 degrees, something like that. Uh, we like to leave it overnight to make sure all of the water has evaporated. But it's, it's really gotten a, a much thicker color. Yes. And it's much like... It's very dense. Yeah, and viscous. Mm-hmm. Yep. Like how it's much flour is in that? There's probably, uh, this is three grams, so there's probably about a little less than an ounce of flour. So an ounce of weed, which is like a hefty bag of yeah. weed. Yeah. Gets yeah. distilled down to just that mm -hmm. little syringe. Yep. Yeah. You would want to take about half of that amount. That is about as much as you would want to take. It's not very much. No. No, but that's, it would be very potent. Absolutely. For the your beginner dose. So I'm about to take a very beginner's dose of yes. extremely highly potent THC oil. Yes. It'll stick to your teeth. Mm -hmm. Ooh. <laughs> it's that thick. <laughs> it's so strong. It's spicy. It has these sort of like, it kind of just tastes like bong water. Or just like, <laughs> And what's funny is sort of like it is a, you know, in your mind, the cancer therapy. Mm -hmm. And it's like I can put it on my finger and kind of take it recreationally. Yes. And like, but you would never do that with a like chemo or like, right. because you don't go into radiation for fun. <laughs> no, not at all. Their medicine is not as much fun to take. <laughs> well, it should be an interesting afternoon for me then. It will. Of being hungry. You and will being feel sleepy. it. <laughs> uh, you will absolutely feel this. I feel like a very deep, thick high around me. Like I'm swimming through something. It's very, uh, it's hugged. I'm like being hugged by my highness. Being hugged by my highness, I love it, I love it. <laughs> That's that a first. Awesome. I've never heard it put like that before. Can but we, it's great. Can we quote you on that, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, <laughs> we met. We met up. <laughs> we met up with Frankie. And they showed us how they made oil, and then I took a little bit. And now I am floating in a cloudy haze of ineptitude. I have no idea what's going on or where I am. It's such a heavy blanket. I'm having a hard time standing up. It's. I mean, it feels like it's really heavy. I guess just gotta shake it off or something, but. It has a very, I feel like I want to lie down. <clears throat> it was just like a little pea drop, so I think it was, I don't know, but it was a lot. Right now I'm feeling incapacitated for the most part. It's not that big of a deal, it's just, it just feels, <laughs> that's all. <laughs> How do we, how do I get myself back? Like, where am I? That's great, that's great. Actually, I, I have to find, I have to find myself. I know where I went. It was very powerful. It was waves that just hit you. I took one tenth of a gram. Lauren takes a gram. 
The general dosage is one gram of cannabis oil, so I took one-tenth of that. But thinking of being this times ten this stoned is alarming. I tried a small dose of oil and got stoned out of my mind. It's hard to imagine my experience times 10, and on a daily basis, no less. Clinical studies show that long-term, heavy cannabis may cause brain impairments, especially in kids and adolescents. I went to meet Olivia Ross, a 17-year-old leukemia patient who takes massive doses of cannabis several times a day. Hey. How are you guys doing? Hi. You want to hop in the back? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> just, just barely made it. I want to take my shoes off. OK. I'm going to keep mine on. Is that weird? Uh -huh. <laughs> What was like the first signs of you being sick? Like, how did you? How'd I was you at find softball out? practice, and uh, my I was like I couldn't see, like my blacked out vision kind of. It's weird. Huh. And uh, I had a fever, and I had to go to the emergency room for my fever. Oh, because it was so high. Yeah, and right after they took my blood counts, they knew that it was off, and that's how it went. Right. And, and so, what was the actual treatment? Can you describe it? The actual treatment was induction, which is a heavy blast of chemo, and that knocks your immune system down to nothing. Mm -hmm. You basically have to die to stay alive. Oh, nice! <laughs> you want to sit in that seat? I don't think we should sit in that seat. I do. <laughs> the chemo must have taken quite a toll on your body. Like, tell me what that was like. I spent a whole hundred days in the hospital without cannabis, on chemo and pain meds, and I had to stay an extra two weeks to get off of the pain medication from withdrawals and sweats and puking. And, you were um, in sweats and puking? It was like you were withdrawing from heroin. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what that's like, but <laughs> it, it was awful, yeah. I wanted to crawl out of my skin, like I didn't want to be there. Like it was really bad. I couldn't sleep, which was the worst part because you're so tired and you can't sleep. When did you hear about or start taking the cannabis oil? I heard about it in the hospital and I tried it after I got home. What was it like right at first when you started trying it? I was like, right, wow, like it was strong, but I slept, I slept just forever. You kind of like have like this constant like sick feeling and like on cannabis when you have all the chemo and stuff in your body that goes away mm -hmm. and it's like it makes you feel like yourself again right yeah take me through you know your typical day now like what is your like you wake up in the morning and what happens after that i get up with my pup and feed her and eat and i would probably take a dab and get in the shower and get ready for school go to school I, when I have a car at school, I usually leave my meds in my car. Otherwise, I will take a capsule before school, and that will carry me over throughout the day. Then at lunch, if I need to, I'll medicate more, but usually I can go through it just till the end of the day. How do you medicate more during lunch? I would vaporize oil uh -huh. or a pen, yeah. Then after school, I'd probably come home, take a dab, and come here probably. I mean, that is a remarkable amount of THC that you're... De oh, definitely. To be able to go to school and still function and talk to my teachers and stuff. Because it's, I guess it's like, you know, when people first take really high-powered stuff, like, they flip out. They, yeah. you know, they can't get off the floor. They think that they're dying, you know what I mean? Like, crazy psychological things happen because it's so strong. Yeah, you don't take a lot of this concentrated oil the first time. When you're doing it for a treatment or to get rid of your cancer, you start out small and build it back up. But when you're doing it as a day-to-day -day relief, symptom relief, that you just have to know your dosing, you know, mm -hmm. control. And why is it that you need so much THC? Like, why isn't it just like a little bit? When you blast your body with THC and it kind of puts the cells back into their dormant state and they can't 
produce any more cancer. You know, your body's not the environment for cancer to thrive. And that's what THC does for your body. And it's so... Right. Yeah. Oh, wow. So Olivia, are you on are you on chemo now? I'm not on chemo anymore. Have you finished your you know prescribed dosage? My end date was supposed to be December 3rd, 2015, but I ended two weeks ago on Tuesday. So you decided to stop nine months early? My counts were getting better, but my doctor wanted me to be taking more chemo to kill more. But I told her that I was gonna be taking cannabis because Cannabis kills cancer without killing anything in your body, so. And now you're doubling down on cannabis because you think it works better than chemo. Yeah. I mean, what, what I find crazy is that, like, you've made this decision, your dad has made this decision, but, like, potentially legally, like, you know, Child Protective Services or some other authority could take you away from your dad because of that. If that were the case, I would probably leave the country. How did the decision to not do the last round of chemotherapy come about? Was it your idea? Was it her idea? Oh, it's totally hers. Yeah, that's her idea. Like if I were Child Protective Services right now and I, I came in and I was like, hey, it is not cool for you to go off of chemo because doctors recommend this and like what you're doing is, you know, a form of neglect. What would your mm -hmm. response be? It's not a form of neglect at all. I, I, I'll tell you, there's the door. But I wonder, like, in a sense, it's sort of like you're, you are creating your own world here, mm -hmm. but there is an outside world. It does actually exist. And, like, there is a CPS, and they do actually exist. Yeah. And, like, that, you know, that, that reality yeah. persists. Yeah. I don't make the decisions for her at all. She's, it's her life. She's gambling, not me. While the other families I met are using marijuana in conjunction with chemo, Olivia is going against authoritative voices and betting the farm on weed alone. Is she living proof that weed works? Or a misguided optimist headed for a dark reality? So this is the day, like, this is the day. we're gonna see if you're cancer free. Yeah. Yeah. How are you feeling today? Good. Go ahead and take off your jacket. We'll need that off for a sec. I'm gonna just slide this underneath here. Like that. You get all nervous? Mm. Alright, just relax. Olivia's having her white blood cell count tested. She hopes to fall within the norm, which would mean her leukemia is still in remission, even though she's no longer on chemo. Alright. You got plenty of blood from me, my dear. Thank you. How long does it take for the results to come back? It should be pretty quick. I think we'll get them about 24 hours or so. Hey, babe. How you doing? Um, do you have a second to talk? Yeah. I don't know. I was feeling like really sort of emotional about the kids that I've been meeting. It's such a different experience thinking about these this story in particular, like now that we have a kid, like I see these parents and I'm like, what would I do if I were in their position? We've never like been faced with something so hard that we were like willing to try things that some people think is a bad idea. Seeing these kids get super high, like you, they're taking the oil, you see it in their eyes, but like what is it doing to like their young little minds and like... Yeah. And that's the thing, if the risk is that you won't get to age four, then what do you care about long-term brain damage? Right, there is no long-term, like, you're just trying to get like, to... Like, you're just trying to get to age four, you're just trying to get to age five, you're just trying to get to age ten. So maybe this barbecue, the one with the stone kids and their stone parents, is something more than just people getting high. It's hosted by Brandon Krenzler and his wife Erin. Their daughter Michaela is also a leukemia patient. They're fighting the disease with cannabis oil, and they're also zealous advocates for medical marijuana and marijuana legalization. We got the fun station over here. Snagged it. I recently quit chemo 
a couple weeks ago and told my doctor that I was done. Quitters. Yeah. Way to go. So, yes, I'm excited. That's a big relief, yeah. She couldn't even get out of bed when I met her. She was really sick. She, it she brought was a tears then. to my face. <laughs> I've seen her quite a few times since she just got onto the cannabis oil. It's amazing to watch it happen. I'm so proud of her. She is such a star. Just keep shining, girl. This knowledge isn't passed through the medical establishment, it's passed through social That's networks true. or networks of people who know about it. Yeah. So do you guys sort of feel like responsible in a way to be kind of a hub or a node? We're part of what we call the cannabis community, and it's not just us. It's, we all it's, want to it's a nationwide effort. Of, we're, we're just a cell of the whole, you know? And, and the whole community is working together and, and <laughs> we're like seeds, man. We're growing, we are the, just like the plant we We all have to grow. work together to get to where we want to be and get the same yeah. thing. Loran had her last checkup in January. Her white blood cell counts have started to return to normal. Kalina still hopes to see her graduate from high school.